He's a radio guy. He knows this. He's going to go first. And in honor of uh, sort of keeping it brief, I thought I should do absolutely no preparation for uh, introducing anyone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm go free. And, but I would think that I would allow myself the luxury of asking each person one question about themselves before I introduce them. And I would base their introduction on that. And so to that end... David is going to be talking about bed bugs, as you know, so I just asked him, have you ever had crabs? And he called her. He had him three times. And he basically turned himself into a circus for his friends, who then came to him, and he had to explain what to do with the colada. And so he had, oh, he had a lifetime of service in insect removal. And therefore, he is our resident expert today on bed David Demchuk. <laughs> All right, that's a far better presentation than what you're getting out of me. Um, am I on? Do I go? Is this a yes? Uh-oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So, yes, I am talking about bed bugs. Um, bed bugs are, of course, like politicians. They bleed us dry, they make us itch, and we just can't seem to get rid of them. No offense to any bed bugs in the audience. Are <laughs> bed bugs? Hands? 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 I, uh, Mark is naked, that's good. Okay. 
Um, DDT, white right from the 1960s and 70s, but now they're back with a vengeance. Toronto Public Health investigated nearly 1,500 cases in 2008, up from just 150 cases in 2006. Um, there are wingless insects, small and flat, about the size of an apple seed, as you can see in that. Uh, they generally come out at night to feed, and they can find you by your body warmth and by your breath. <laughs> uh, they feed you by they feed on you by squirting an anesthetic saliva into you to break up your blood cells and then sucking the stuff back out. It's the saliva that causes the reaction, the welt that many people experience. You're disgusting, Grandpa. That's true. <laughs> Most of us they don't want to live near their food source, but they don't want to be disturbed. They can nest in your mattress, but they can also live under your baseboards, in the cracks of your bed frame and furniture, and underneath your box frame. So you're all checking at home when you get there. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, or how much you make, until you want to get rid of them. That's another story. It's a long, expensive, soul-destroying process. If you live in Rosedale, you can hire an exterminator and replace all your furniture. But what if you live in St. Jamestown? Bed bugs come and go everywhere else in the city, but when there's no money to treat or prevent them, bed bugs come and stay. So why talk about bed bugs in an event like this? Well, Toronto has faced a few blood sucking pests before. <laughs> For example. <laughs> ever since. And this man promised in two campaigns that those services would be uploaded back to the province. Only now has this started. It's a pro process that will take 10 years and it could be stopped at any time. The city's most effective agency in fighting, uh, fighting bedbugs has been Toronto Public Health, but they're doing it with no new money and no new staff. Thanks to the Harris legacy, Ontario is the only province where public health services are paid for out of local property taxes. As you can see from this chart, eight cents for each, each tax dollar goes to back to the municipality, whereas the provincial and federal government get 92 cents. We can't keep the property taxes alone, and we can't keep cutting services to make ends meet. Things have to change, and they have to change now. Our city councillors and our mayor must fight to have social service costs returned to the province and we have to elect people who will fight that fight. The province must take back its role of funding public health, and it must support and expand the Toronto Bedbug Project, making it permanent for the foreseeable future. <laughs> City councillors must work with public health and the community to identify problem buildings and problem landlords, and that includes Toronto community housing and ensure that minimum housing standards are being maintained and enforced. Above all, Toronto must have a coherent and coordinated strategy from all levels of government on inequalities in income, housing and health. These three things are intertwined and their byproducts affect all our lives and the lives of our city itself. Thanks to cheaper worldwide travel, less toxic insecticides, and the past the buck attitude from the powers that be, it seems the bed bug is probably here to stay. And the people who are most vulnerable are those who don't have the information or the resources to fight them. Toronto should be and can be a city that helps its poorest and least capable to live better lives on every front, even this one. And this is dedicated to Julius Deutsch. Thank you. You know, Chrissy Hine. I'm not going to say Mick Jagger, okay guys? You're going to be Chrissy. For me, anyway. <laughs> and uh, so really get comfortable with Mike because you're going to be the big political change makers of your generation. you got to love this, Mike. Tonight is a big practice session. And this is a handy dandy rack if you want to use it. But if you want to look at your slides, we're just going to cheat this stuff over here a little bit so you don't lose your audio, okay? So we're all set up. And we're ready for the next person. By the name of Justin Kozuk. Close. 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 See, I didn't waste my, my only question on pronunciation. Maybe I should have. But he's doing a presentation about information collection that I couldn't even understand the title. So thank God I'm here for the presentation. But it's something about remembering data. So I had to ask him if he remembered the phone number from when he was a 10-year-old. And he does. And let's say it together. 905. 
one, three, or one. What do you know? He's a genius. Welcome, Justin.
another big race where there's no men in it in Toronto this year. You might want to think about that. Okay, so thank you, Camille. Okay, so I'm going to use my notes. Apologies. So I'm worried about the state of democracy in our city. Uh, thousands of us took to the streets a few weeks ago to protest the state of democracy in Ottawa, but what about the problems in our own backyard? In the last municipal election, turnout was only 41%. And not only is turnout too low, but look at the outcome. Do you see the face of Toronto reflected on city council? We're one of the most culturally diverse cities in the world, yet 9 of 10 councillors are white and 8 of 10 are men. So our city council clearly isn't purely representative, and that suggests to me one of two problems. Either voters don't care, <laughs> or the system screwed up. And I say the system screwed up. It was developed when people still thought the earth was flat, and that was fine for the 11th century, but uh, that was because it was replacing no voting at all. Uh, now it has one major flaw, and that's that it's not democratic. Um, not all voters get to elect someone. In 2006, 44% of us elected no one to city council. Uh, but democracy means that everyone has uh, the right to representation regardless of how you vote. So in your ward, maybe 60% of the voters are on the right and 40 on the left. And if you're the 40 on the left, you still deserve that representation. But like many things in life, the answers can be found in the package of Smarties. So let's look at the problem here. These are people living in a ward in Toronto. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we'll say there are two groups, uh, instead of left and right, let's call them blue and yellow. And here we see our yellow and blue voters living in three different wards. And each ward has both a yellow and a blue candidate, but since Toronto uses a winner-take-all system, uh, each uh, ward can only elect one councillor. So in each of these wards, there are slightly more yellow voters than blue. And if you see what happens here, even though uh, many voters cast blue ballots, only yellow candidates are elected. So the blue ele voters elect no one to sit on city council for them. So when winner-take-all elections happen in 44 individual wards, well, it's no kidding that city council doesn't reflect the face of the community and that our concerns often go unheard. So what can we do differently? The best way to make city council representative is by electing a number of people in each ward. Let's look at the Smarties again. Instead of three smaller wards, the same people could vote in a larger ward with three, that elect three councillors. And the blue Smarties here elected no one before, but now because they're one third of the voters, they can elect one third of the uh, councillors. So how would we give full representation to all Toronto voters? Instead of 44 wards electing just one person each, we could have nine larger wards with five councillors each. And if you think back to the Smarties, five people elected in each ward means that 20% of the voters could elect someone. And it means more diversity, it sets the stage for more ethnic diversity, gender diversity, and even age diversity. But lots of people have schemes on how to build a better democracy, so it's just one of the, another lunatic fantasy. Or is it so complicated and confusing to voters that no one has ever done it? Uh, no, the system is used quite widely. Uh, over 100 councils in Scotland, Ireland, New Zealand, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in the early part of the 1900s, uh, New York, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Boulder, Toledo, Sacramento, and here at home in Canada, we have Vancouver, Victoria, Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, and 12 other cities. So it is being done. Uh, Canadians shocked politicians in the media a few weeks ago uh, by taking to the streets, but we don't have representative democracy here in Toronto, and we don't have a council that represents the face of our population. But we could have that if we demanded it, um, and I think we must demand a new voting system that gives us full representation. We could demand the right to cast a ballot that elects someone to council, even if we're a minority in our part of the city, and we could demand that Toronto lead the way with municipal voting reform. So we can do this, and I think we must do this for the sake of democracy, and I'm going to keep on working on this project, and I hope you will join me. And uh, you can see fairvote.ca for more information. <laughs> Time. This is great. We're right on schedule. Fantastic presentations and an attentive audience. You know, they're, you know, sometimes you're in an audience, they're all meow, meow, meowing at the back. This is all working out great. There is going to be a small break now, but we do have a little bit of spoken word 
sort of um, a sort of a, a palate cleanser in between courses of three or four presentations. And her name is Tanya Newmeyer. So she's going to do a bit of ten, five minute little presentation, mill around, get another drink. We got to make that bar quota. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One of the many organizers. Knowing that what we need is openness and trust. This is the kind of call for you to open your mind and heart. Sometimes it's obvious, like signs hanging in store windows saying, Open! I sit behind an open cash register these days and people ask me, uh, Are you open? I hope so. I'd like to be in the way we can be open to the possibility. See, we open files, open doors, open books, open spaces, but how do we open hearts and minds? Because being open is an act of love, necessitating courageous truth-telling. And I've been trying to use this word, love, with you. But instead I tell you that Adrian Rich writes that an honorable human relationship that is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is a process. Delicate, violent, often terrifying to both persons involved, the process of refining the truths they can tell each other. Let me tell you, I'm still learning to be open. Sometimes, when I open up, it seems to spill out, leaving me vulnerable. So I've been waiting for someone to welcome me in to say, you don't need to be anything but yourself here. Welcome. But welcome too. I'd like to see you. Sometimes I feel this fear of dependency, so I need to see the truth that we are interconnected. We are interdependent. We support one another. That's okay. It's more than okay. It's necessary still. I can't keep throwing caution to the wind. If I do, I won't last. I've heard weatherproofing is dangerous, but how will we be prepared without honestly asking questions, being full of care, and speaking truthfully? Yes, this is our resistance, our means are remaining together, whole, not tossed to pieces, carefully built to withstand the storms of loneliness, passion, rage, and change, not in order but chaos. You see, I thought opening was something I'm good at, but it turns out that without the corresponding skills of closing things up, of healing old wounds, there's so much hesitancy to start anew, to begin again, to start again, I tell you, that Adrian Rich writes, that it is important to do this, because it breaks down human self-delusion and isolation. It is important to do this because in doing so we do justice to our own complexity. It is important to do this because so few people will go that hard way with us. So I'm looking forward to your phone call, the sound of your voice, and soon I hope the sweet release of being in your arms. Love, Tanya. Truth be told, I love you! And I haven't always had the courage to say that aloud. Sometimes before I know it, the season passes, we are apart, no longer together. We still have our honesty, so don't help me put off the misery of this life, rather help me face it. Boldly, bravely, singing, and strong. Because the best parts of me are about loving. The rest of me has got to get sorted out to do more of what I'm here to do. I'm hereby open to the possibility. Are you? Thank you. Whoa. So that's a bit of a taste of what performance poetry can be like. Uh, there's a monthly event that happens at the Drake. It's usually this third Saturday. You'll get uh, lots of diversity represented on that stage there. Uh, this month is happening Friday, February 19th. There will be another poet from our slam scene up on the mic shortly for our next break. Uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, contentious and important and progressive issues that are raised here tonight. So I perform poetry and I also run workshops. You can uh, speak to me about them if you're interested. The workshops are kind of to say to you, it's possible for you to do this too. So, here's a new piece. If you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'll do this next one and that's it. Merry Christmas, beautiful. There's a story here about finding beauty in discomfort. See, I shared last Christmas with a friend's family. We were served aphorisms after dinner. 
small pieces of paper tied with ribbon, mine red. If we all threw our problems in a pile and saw everyone else's, we'd quickly take back our own. I'm taken back to Christmas Eve of giving out chocolate on the streets of Toronto with friends. We were three women in a humble get-around car. On a night that was cold and quiet because most people are at home with family or friends. We were downtown meeting people who were sitting on steps, wandering around, or buried under blankets. Needless to say, these encounters made an impression. We didn't have much to give, but for chocolate and some well wishes. One of these encounters stands out more than others in memory. As he was at the corner of Bathurst and Queen Street, inside a streetcar shelter, where there was a young woman who appeared to be kept warm by a few belongings around her feet. She met me with a Merry Christmas, beautiful. This encounter is etched in my memory. You might say I was charmed, but also I'm haunted by ghosts of Christmas past, a family gathering so uncomfortable that it was only the calm of light rain under street light that helped me catch my breath again. See, I'm aware. If I were to throw my problems in a pile amongst those of the street involved people in Toronto, they might not compare. But I've been challenged to ask tougher questions. Like, can I take back more than I thought I was able to? And can I take action towards housing and support for all? Thanks. Have a great night. Give it up for everyone involved. Go Tio. Go Tio. She was close to the nap room. It's true. And the private phone booth. But the bigger problem is she's too busy to use either of them. So, Yvonne Bamberg, the hardest working girl in complete street business.
would you support those? Or, or even just, you know, the notion of complete streets, which you'll hear about later. Um, but I'll, oh, look, more. Uh, as a consumer, <laughs> you can talk to your local merchant. You know, where, if you've got a helmet, bring it in with you. Say, hey, thanks for that great bar- bike parking outside. Let them know that you're spending your local dollars in their shop as a cyclist. The more we talk to our merchants and let them know about it, uh, the better. In your community, um, <laughs> consider becoming part of your local residence uh, uh, association or condo board. Talk to your neighbors and friends about why you enjoy cycling. Hello? Better health, cost-effective form of transportation. Look, education. Promote cycling as an option to your friends and family. And also tell folks about the CAN bike courses. There's great education available for new cyclists. And there's a link there. This will be up later and you can follow the links. Or you can share your knowledge. Are you a bike buddy? Maybe you could take a friend for a ride on the weekend. Take them around their block. Maybe go for a ride in the park. You know, isn't that cute? That's me and my friend Kelsey riding a double side by side bike. Um, anyway, share. Yeah, and this one's really important. Be a safe and responsible cyclist. People are watching you and they're judging all of us. And it sucks, but it's true. So give respect, get respect. Try and signal your intentions, you know, wave at drivers, smile at them, point at them, whatever, but figure it out. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, become a member of the Viking Union, please. That goes a long way. It really does support the work we're doing. We've got a ton of great volunteers working with us, but uh, we're basically funded by you guys, so if you can get behind us, we'd really appreciate it. And, oh, look, big news. Uh, we're getting, <laughs> most of you probably heard this by now, but we're getting a public bike share system in Toronto. <laughs> Tell your candidates and your account or your your, uh, your counselor that you support the idea. Definitely, that's super important, and you can be part of making Toronto one of the best cities in North America to ride in. We can totally do it. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, and in and around the Bloor Street issue, again, if you live on Bloor Danforth anywhere, it, talk to the merchants along that strip. They need to hear that bikes are important. Um, and yeah, here's some interesting links. We have a joint events calendar called Bike Event To. We need one like the boot service industry inspection system. 
We need this, uh, the same regard for our dwellings as we do for our restaurants, and we need the same respect for the place where we sleep as well as we eat. Imagine if your restaurants weren't licensed. Uh, would you eat in the diner that had cockroaches, holes in the ceilings, and vermin running by your feet? And if the plumbing didn't work, would you take your friends out to the local pub? Now look at this. Would you take your mother to dinner at a restaurant that was filthy and smelled like black mold? And I know that some of you out there uh, might be cheap Valentine dates, but <laughs> are you really going to take her to a place like this? Now, the city would never let restaurants be unlicensed. Restaurants in Toronto are inspected, they're evaluated, and then they're shut down if they are uh, not up to code. Apartment buildings should be treated exactly the same. And that's why ACORN members are campaigning for landlord life saving. Because people need to know that they're getting what they pay for, and people shouldn't wake up to unexpected guests in the morning. Everybody needs a clean and safe environment to live in. The campaign is what we want to focus on for this election. 50% of the Torontonians are renters, and many continue to live in unfit conditions, and we need to eliminate the profitability of slum landlords. Now, here's our three proposals. Every building should be inspected, results made public, and posted. If the building is not up to livable standards, the landlord is the one who should pay, not the tenants. <laughs> and how are they going to pay? Landlords should pay fees just as restaurants to ensure that inspections keep happening and buildings are kept up to code. Not in 34 years, but right now. And that's why we need tenants and everybody else to get out and vote and vote for candidates to support tenant issues and the renters of the city. We need your support for a landlord fee. Clean and affordable housing is a right. It is not a privilege. album purchase was way too cool for all of us. <laughs> it was the White Album. I bring you Jamal Montaxi. Cadbury, for example, 
have all fair trade dairy milk chocolate bars in the UK, and that will be coming to Canada this summer. And the idea of fair trade towns is actually not that far-fetched as well, because the map of the UK that has almost 400 fair trade cities and towns. Guess how many eight Canada have? How, how many Canada has? One. Eight. So we are obviously very behind. And it's rumored that Vancouver could be the first large city in Canada to be a fair trade city. So what does it take, of course, to be a fair trade city? Well, first, city council has to have a resolution that um, uh, they will only use fair trade coffee, tea, and sugar, and other products when available in municipal meetings and offices. As well, a committee would be struck that has a member of city council and is largely made up of community members so that we can actually get restaurants, cafes, community groups, space groups, schools and universities to start using fair trade products in order to get a minimum number of those using fair, fair trade products to meet the criteria that would make us a fair trade designated city. So I think the implications of us actually becoming a fair trade city are pretty significant. It's not only that we have a positive impact on farmers overseas, but it's that we're signifying to other top tier cities in the world that it's possible to become a fair trade city and to actually play an active role in the world. And it's an institutional recognition, recognition of the idea that we Torontonians actually can play an active role in the world and choose to have the type of impact we want in the world with the decisions we make. I want to finish with a quote from a farmer who we worked with in Malawi on a coffee cooperative. He says, we recently received fair trade certification so our customers all over the world can be confident that the price they pay directly benefits our smallholder coffee farmers here in Malawi. Our cooperative will invest the fair trade premium that we now receive back in the community through investment in education. You will help our community to develop and build our own hospital, roads that are passable year-round, and staff schooled with highly qualified teachers. And I think that brings it back to the idea of opportunity. And I want to throw the question to us as Torontonians. What role will our, our city play in increasing or decreasing opportunities for those vulnerable people who are afflicted by poverty everywhere else in the world? Thank you. Rob? Rob's not in the room. Okay, but Rob certainly seemed to have something to say, which was that 200 people in the room and no mayoral candidates. Hey! Okay, there's one. Hey, yeah. Two. And, and I did see Dave Meslin in the room. We might have to put him forward at some point. Mayoral material in here, Robbie baby. Get just get down here. Check it out. Contest isn't over yet. Okay, my next guest, Jamie. A man on the eve of the Olympics, a man so Canadian when asked, snowboarding or skiing, he said skating. <laughs> So my name is Jamie Kirkpatrick and I'm a tea campaigner. Is that or is that no? Tea is actually the Toronto Environmental Alliance. We've been around for 22 years. We've been working with local people on local issues, fighting for environmental progress in Toronto. Started back in 1988 with a bunch of people who were tired of their families being polluted and toxins. So here we are today, and uh, just yesterday there was a bit of a scandal, but before that we announced six environmental priorities for Toronto. Ourselves and 12 other environmental groups endorsed a way forward that we want to see all the mayoral candidates agree. There's going to be a lot of things we don't agree on, but we should agree that the transit and all these other issues are important. So the first one is transit. Everyone's favorite whipping boy right now. Uh, Riders pay 70% of the operating fee of transit. It's the highest rate in North America. We need a muddy train coming from Queens Park in Ottawa to fix this problem. We've seen money come for capital projects. We've seen ribbon cutting ceremonies, but no one wants to pay to make the system run. So it's on the backs of riders right now, and we need to speak up. And so what we're saying is our first priority is to see transit cities built and properly funded. We want all candidates to agree to this message. Thank you very much. All right, now, our, uh, our second priority is to get the city of Toronto 
to achieve its 70% waste diversion target, and we're saying by 2012. They're supposed to be done by 2010, but the problem is, is we didn't roll out green bins in apartments, and that's where half of us live. So there's no way we're going to get to 70% without including all of Toronto, including those that live in green, in, in that, not green bins, who live in apartments. <laughs> there and uh, with green bins in every apartment and a few other measures we know we can get to that 70% target so we want Toronto's next mayor to do that for us. Here we are number three, buy and support locally produced green products. We should be having solar panels and windmills put up all over the city built here by unionized workers. We want good green jobs for all in Toronto. We want to make sure that our next mayor and council recognizes this by putting a priority on local procurement, local purchasing, local building of these materials. We can do this. We have the power. We have people ready to do the work. We just need to empower them to do it. By Toronto. That's right. By Toronto. And you know, another idea that we've heard Vaughn talk about, so I won't go into this too much, is really build infrastructure that people can use who don't just drive cars. We bike in the city. We walk. Those are good modes of transportation for the environment. We need a mayor who recognizes that and isn't afraid to say bike lanes are okay. Yeah. Next yeah. priority, number five, is finally stop talking about sustainable energy and start building and implementing it. This means working with the utilities we have, Enbridge, Enwave, and publicly owned Toronto Hydro. Woo! Woo! Make sure that we have more of these showing up in Toronto. We need to see Toronto become a green energy leader and to do it again, buying local, working in Toronto, we can do it. <clears throat> and I'd like to say number six before it shows up is to provide the tools to prevent pollution. Our neighbors are Toronto businesses who work in our communities, but they may have a problem with pollution. So we want to see the city help them out with this. There's 25 priority pollutants that the city is now asking small businesses to report on. We need to give them the tools to make sure that they can prevent pollution, stay in our neighborhoods, and work well. So community right to know bylaw passed and we want to see people like Liz Hill be able to go outside and let her kids play in the backyard and not have horrible fumes keeping her indoors. So we want to work with our local business to make sure that we prevent pollution. These next steps, we're going to be interviewing mayoralty candidates, maybe we'll talk to some tonight, and make sure that you guys understand that these priorities are priorities for Torontonians. We want to see Toronto continue to be a green leader in North America. We don't want to regret. And, uh, Great image here. Michael Hay, thank you for the presentation. The many can overcome the few. Please support these initiatives. Go to torontoenvironment.org slash VoteTO. Sign up, endorse these priorities, and ask your candidates at the door if they support the six environmental priorities for Toronto. <laughs>
I'm here also mostly in the lottery for people. Um, also, I'm, uh, I'm developing a project called the Green Feather Project, which is really just in a agency right now. It's just something that has uh, been a brainstorm of mine and some, uh, some colleagues and some peers of mine. Um, but basically, my vision is to, uh, is to do a tour across the country. Uh, uh, the Green Feather Project is an eco, 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 multidisciplinary eco art tour that uh, Really what we want to do is, uh, is empower musicians, uh, young musicians, people who are like, making bands, singer-songwriters, people who are buying music, people who are going to venues and small towns and seeing shows, uh, and really empower these people to, uh, to promote sustainable music and to demand sustainable music and to make sustainable music. So, uh, and also the tour will be happening in a uh, recycled school bus powered by uh, waste vegetables, which is pretty cool as well. Project that's really in its infancy right now, uh, but I'm just looking to collaborate with uh, anyone who would be willing to help out, has any suggestions, has any resources that would be useful, um, whether it's in the city of Toronto or in, in cities across the country. Uh, just looking for people who are uh, interested in a project like this, uh, or for me, people who need music, people who buy them, and people who see shows, uh, and who are interested in ways to, uh, to make this project um, to make it happen, to make it uh, to be everything that I envision it to be. So, um, Vancouver and Montreal have municipal parties. 
that at least officially are independent from provincial and federal parties. And while some argue that city council is better off with independent councilors, others argue that parties are already uh, exist behind the scenes at City Hall and it would be better if they were transparent. Montreal has a really interesting borough system, this is how it could look in Toronto, that is, uh, essentially um, mitigates the consequences of amalgamation. The local council, um, uh, each neighborhood elects their own council and their own mayor. Uh, New York City also elects president in each borough. Term limits, of course, uh, is used all across the, uh, the U.S. and American cities. It creates a guaranteed cycle of turnover and allows new faces on council more easily. Some argue that it's undemocratic and could cost us good politicians who deserve to get reelected. But let's look at it. Ranked ballots are used in many cities in the U.S. It's a simple and easy to implement solution that eliminates vote splitting, eliminates strategic voting, brings more voices into the election, and produces fairer results. It's used in San Francisco and Minneapolis. Multi-member districts, as we heard earlier, have many advantages. They allow for outcomes that are proportional. For example, if 20% of the voters believe in a certain idea, right now they'll get shut out in every ward, but if a ward has five representatives, they will win one of those seats. The downside is the wards become very large. There are many other options worth looking at, such as at-large seats and weekend voting. This chart shows 30 cities and who is using some of these ideas I've talked about. Um, Toronto is the only city that hasn't explored any of these options. Our job at Better Ballots is to raise awareness and to put this issue on the map. We're off to a great start. We have the cover of iWeekly last week. We have a lot of supporters and volunteers. But what we really need is you. We need your energy. We need your creativity. We need your time. And we need your ideas. You can visit our website. You can go to our Facebook group. You can also go to the Twitter thing if you're into that sort of stuff. Thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Thanks for inviting us. We're Better Ballots, and we're ready. When asked if she is a political, a female political politician she admires, it would be Libby Davies. Who knows who she is? Thank you. Libby Davies is absolutely fearless. I love her. Who am I looking at? Over here? Oh, oh, oh. So, the Toronto Women's City Alliance was founded in 2004 by a diverse group of women who all had one common concern, that the voices of women and girls was disappearing from the city's agenda. The status of women's committee had stopped meeting in years, and so now at City Hall, who speaks for women and girls? You might be asking, aren't women already equal? Isn't Toronto already a women-friendly city? The answer is not simple, a yes or a no. We have to look beneath the surface. For example, when we put the gender equity lens, onto a particular subject such as poverty, and we take a look at children in poverty, we now realize that it's not children who are poor, it's their low-income women of color mothers who are poor. Women come from all walks of life and have intersectional identities. Yet, the reality for women is that we face greater violence, poverty, homelessness, poor diet, unemployment, precarious work, discrimination, inefficient daycare, unaffordable, inaccessible public transportation. Try taking a baby stroller onto the crowded bus or subway, and you'll get my point. Toronto is already getting ready to post, host excuse me, the World Pride and to host the Pan Am Games. The world is coming to Toronto, and we are getting ready. In fact, we're building new subways, new homes, new shiny buildings, and new roads. How much of, of this economic stimulation is actually going to benefit women? How much of this is going to create green, good jobs? Is Toronto really ready for our close-up? Let's find out what women in Toronto how women in Toronto care, compare to others living in Madrid, Zurich, Vienna, Barcelona, London, San Francisco, or even Seoul, Korea. These are just a few of the cities, large and small, that have seen the benefits of a women's equality office. How can Toronto declare itself a world-class city when more than half of its population is still being marginalized? These cities have dedicated staff and resources to make, the women's issues do not, make sure that women's issues do not disappear from the urban agenda. They have been able to increase the employment rates for women, make transit safer and more accessible, and to adapt policies to reduce the barriers for women's participation in municipal programs. Women in Toronto are not very well. We only make 71 cents on the male dollar, and it gets worse. 50, 56 cents on the male dollar if you're an Aboriginal woman. Women in Toronto make up 52% of the population, and yet only 11% of the elected officials. Middle class women, or even affluent women, are only one man away from poverty. 
we look back into the archives of women plant Toronto to see where women, uh, what, what women were talking about 30 years ago, and pretty much they're talking about the same things. So what would a Toronto Women's Equality Office do in Toronto? It would create a city where everyone feels safe to walk. We can all afford to buy a home to live in. We can live in nice housing. Our children will be cared for when needed. And we can breathe clean air. And we can get around the city easily and affordably. In our current project, we conducted focus groups with a broad range of women across the city and talked to them about their experiences with city services. We asked them to draw what a friendly woman's city would look like. These are some of these images. I get a break. <laughs> so the Toronto Women's City Alliance is trying to make this a reality. We believe that to achieve a women-friendly Toronto, we need to do what other cities have already done and to establish a women's equality office, a publicly funded department at the city who will take into account women's lived experiences and it's, in its all its budgeting, its planning, and its policy. So how can we make this happen? Well, we can all make this happen. Quite honestly, go talk to your city councillors. Talk to the mayoral candidates. We have a couple of them here tonight. Make sure that they know that you want to see a women's equality office at City Hall. They will no doubt tell you it's a good idea, but the city is broke. To that, you tell them women's equality is the biggest bang for their buck. We will start spending money differently. That's right. We will start spending money differently based on the user requirements of women and girls through gender budgeting. budgeting. We won't have to go to court to fight over hockey time, ice time for hockey. Yeah. When women are, have equality, we are able to work, pay our taxes, take better care of ourselves and our families. Who doesn't want that? 2010 is our year. Join us in our efforts. Let's not squander the opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's neat to hear from people like you. So keep... And Fantastic. Great idea. Thank you very much, Kristen. Okay. Our next contestant. Do you know what he's going to talk about? Do you know what Fix Toronto's about? Well, it's very, very good. Let's just bring him up here. He can surprise you. David Regan, a man after my feline propensity. Hi, thank you. Okay, so um, this past summer, my family spent about a week at a cottage in Essex County. Uh, we the National Park was just down the street, so there were birds all over the place, but there were almost as many cats as birds. Uh, Ten lived next door, and a litter of kittens had just been born on the beach. Toward the end of our stay, a tabby showed up at our door, and uh, he wouldn't leave, even though we gave him a veggie sausage and some soy beverage. Uh, the couple next door had no more room, and a local cat rescue told us they were already caring for upwards of 150 cats, and that the area human societies were full. Meanwhile, our temporarily vegan stray was getting bullied by the neighbors, so when it came time for us to pack up, we stuck him in the back seat, and we called him Jeff. All of us were glad to get away from Essex County and back to a place where companion animals are not tossed away like trash. Uh, back in Toronto, however, disillusionment set in pretty fast. Jeff thought his balls cut off practically the moment we entered the GTA. Uh, then it turned out that Jeff himself is kind of a bully. He won't stop pestering our other cat. And I came to understand that Toronto has a cat problem as severe as Essex County's. Ours made headlines in November when the OSPCA raided the Toronto Humane Society, at least in part due to the Humane Society's inevitable inability to keep up with our cat problem. Uh, at the time of the raid, the Humane Society was housing over 1,000 cats, and our animal services killed about four times that many in 2007, which is the last year that data is available for, which is just a bit less than um, the Essex, Windsor Essex Humane Society killed in the same year. So uh, where are all these cats that we're killing coming from? It's been suggested that anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000 cats live in our backyards, our boatyards, uh, our parks, our alleyways. Um, these cats avoid humans and are most active when we're mostly asleep, so it's impossible to know precisely how many of them are out there. For tonight, let's just say, you know, there's about tens of thousands of them, tens of thousands of little Jeffs. Uh, how did they get there? First of all, they're lost or they're abandoned, like Jeff was. They had families and then they didn't. Uh, their offspring go wild or feral, and lost, abandoned, or feral, they can re reproduce really fast, although they have uh, pretty high mortality rates, too. That's the problem then. Tens of thousands of unseen Jeffs living precarious lives in our shadows. I've got good news though, there are solutions. First, a low cost, high volume, spay neuter facility. By the time we got Jeff home for good, we spent uh, about 500 bucks giving it to our vets. That included uh, vaccinations and tests, but sterilization itself is an expense that many pet owners 
cannot afford. There's a low cost facility in Newmarket, there's one in Barrie, there's one in Calgary, and guess who's building one right now? Fucking Essex County. <laughs> Plus, Republicans will stop needlessly killing tax by 2012. Toronto has to catch up. Second, we've got to do something called TNR, Trap Neuter Return, on a citywide basis. Uh, in a TNR program, homeless cats are trapped, sterilized, then returned to wherever they make their home. And their subsequently dwindling colonies are maintained, too. In fact, when we're done here tonight, I'm going to go feed 13 colonies in the Kensington Market neighborhood. So, if it smells like cat food in here, it's my fault, although you probably could have inferred that. Um, <laughs> a number of our neighbors are already working on this problem uh, using TNR. I volunteer with Annex Cat Rescue and Toronto Cat Rescue is the biggest such organization in the city. Both rescues also foster and adopt out cats that can be socialized to humans. Uh, Toronto Cat Rescue right now has about 250 available and kitten season is just around the corner. These rescues do wonderful, heroic work, but they, it's not enough. They can't solve our cat problem on their own. What's needed now is uh, some political leadership. We need someone who can bring together the human stakeholders to coordinate a long-term solution based on TNR. I don't want to suggest this is going to be easy, but I also don't want to understate the severity of the problem, the urgency of the problem. The people working on the ground to solve this problem call their organizations rescues, and the appellation is not hyperbolic. These cats live in a constant state of emergency. They're hard to see, and they're not eligible to vote, but they nevertheless have interests that are often quite similar to our own. They want to live in a city that is safe, and they want to be able to stay healthy. What I want is to live in a city that's brave and compassionate enough to try to take the interests of all of its denizens, human and non-human, into account. Thanks for hearing me. Okay, we have a man.
Um, so benefits. This is this is all kind of obvious stuff for most of you, I know, but um, this it's just like the right thing to do. Um, we uh, most people in in Toronto don't drive cars, and for whatever reason, whether it's because they can't or because they don't want to, so we need to be accommodating those people's safety. Uh, the most vulnerable people, um, in particular, um, old, older people, uh, children. We need to be considering those people when we're designing our streets, and these are the benefits. Uh, this is the, so yeah, if we're actually uh, making a city where uh, it's, it's great to get around by bike, people will get out and do it. Uh, there's a really latent desire uh, for people to uh, to want to get out and bike and to be physically active. The benefits in the environment, we know that the um, um, smog, we know, all, we know all this. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> really good I was going to say there. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's cheaper to design roads that are not just for cars and also on the flip side we know that it's the uh, the businesses that are downtown, they benefit from people cycling and walking so we need to be providing more streets like that. Uh, what we're asking for, uh, we want in 2010 we want there to be a complete streets policy in Toronto. We want it to start here. We want the first one to be in Canada to be in Toronto. So we want, we're going to be putting in a petition about that. We have, we're going to have a website. We also have a really cool forum coming up. On August, on April 22nd and 23rd, the uh, founder of the Complete Streets Coalition in the US, U.S. is coming. She just signed on this week. I'm so excited to have her. Uh, so come to that and sign our petition. Complete Streets. to be a tour guide. I've seen several of them in the room right here from other years. Lead a walk through your neighborhood. You can profile the walkability issues that you encounter, but they can also be just walks for the joy of walking and connecting with neighbors. But remember, folks, most city planners spend a lifetime figuring out how to get that many people on the sidewalk that you have to jaywalk to get across. This is a good thing to have happen in a city. Jaywalking indicates a healthy street population. It is not illegal. You're not supposed to slow down the traffic, okay? But it's not illegal. So don't take that stand up your right to actually uh, move, your, move on your feet. It's a fun thing to do. In fact, a lot of people take vacations in Europe just so they can do it. You can actually have it where you live all the time. Okay, so be a James Locke guy. That's my pitch. We're now going to go to another spoken word artist by the name of Mike Split. Mike Split. Did I say that? <laughs> he says he'll take it. He'd like a split right now. Okay, Mike Smith, come on up here. Do some work. Thank you. Drop off the ceiling, off the skate like a fucking panther, and then they're gone behind their doors. 
<laughs> Look how much behind the door. Just tell us what we We take my word for it. But friends, you will not have to take my word for anything because when you reach for it, it won't be there. I should explain. Now, most kids, it's from the standard Baroque platform, the uh, rapid tuning approach. I'll be your voice in government, poor people. I'll be your voice in government, too, rich people. I'll uh, try to stack the your hair directly in the halls of power. I will put your services by cutting your taxes by harnessing the power of Jupiter. I will make your cat less expensive. You're not interested in Jupiter cats. I've seen the numbers. You are interested in not being interested. Now, hard work and determination built this city. This is some help from rock and roll. That is true. <laughs> but ambivalence has kept us from tearing it back down again, am I right? So I commit to not committing. I promise to promise nothing but that. And this, friends, it is my vow to you that when I am elected, I will resign. The <laughs> Absolutely. The national advocate. And try to remember the names of people who want to turn you into a number so we're not going to be around long enough for you to go to the trouble. <laughs> we're trying to set an example. I mean, because it won't be that much worse if a few more self important white dudes just step down. Don't think of us as figureheads, though. Think of us as holes blown in the bulkhead of an airlock so that the oxygen of the people is blown into that abhorrent vacuum, I think. Honestly, all that I know about these spaces is I learned from Battlestar Galactica, but. Nonetheless, you must admit that even a pseudo-fascist robotic opera manages to present politics a little more realistically than anything I've ever read in the Toronto Sun. Voting the star. Honestly, in deep space, they're kind of the same thing anyway, but... And you think about it like, Lee, he got to cheat on his partner how many times? There's absolutely no repercussions. Adama, Adam, and my team, I think, oh, never mind, we'll move on. So don't think of us as a disease, think of us as a vaccine. Part of the disease, the negligible section of it direct, injected directly into the system and then immediately destroyed. How about we're going to get rid of smoke for someone else? In four years, you forget why you hate us. Impeachment? It's an election in reverse. Assassination. I'm, I'm glad you said that, sir. I think that all of us here have tried to kill a civil servant at least once in our place. Am I right? I mean, how many forms can I make you fill out for just one little murder? No! The NAP is a dead man's switch of freedom. We commit to stumbling in, breaking. Something and stumbling out again, all the more our eyes are just to the light. Now, if you think about it, my opponents have promised much the same just for a period. But you can't make that love. You rip the band aid off that kind of people. You don't need those blowhards. The NAP will not blow. We will take the rifle of responsible government. We'll wrap our lips around that barrel and we will suck hard. No more string of empty promises like Ronnie Mindless fucking never battle with the sub, never good enough to climax. We promise you a resounding anti climax. We will blow our political load all over your sweater as soon as you unzip us and then fall asleep. I can't. But we need your help, friends. We want to run candidates in all wars, and we want to elect candidates in all wars, and we want every candidate in every war ready with a victory speech and a resignation speech. And it's going to be the same speech. So who's ready? Who's going to help me? Who feels like pretending to seem to have the time to run for an office that they don't actually really want? Step up and step down, Annie Clive. Shoot for the moon, Trinity Spadina. They say democracy. We say more for that. We think that Toronto is tired of the bullshit, and Toronto needs a nap. Thank you. Thank you very much. Linebreaks.com. You can find out at linebreaks.com. You can find out more about spoken word in Toronto at torontopoetryslam.com. Thank you. All at the same time, he is a fierce contender. is the old Wellesley Hospital. Some of you may remember it. This is 1912, history lesson. Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Prime Minister of Canada, founding of the Wellesley Hospital. Remember this guy, Dr. Herbert Bruce. We're going to come back to him in just a second. In 1912, Toronto, at the start of the 20th century, was horribly unhealthy. Poor immigrants were crowded into terrible slums in the very shadow of Toronto City Hall. Toronto Medical Officer Felt Dr. Charles Hastings was ordered to do something, to do anything, to improve the city's health. 
So he said, let's focus on the fundamentals, and one of those fundamentals is housing. He built the city's first affordable housing project, Spruce Court Apartments, in 1912. Thanks to his pioneering work, the health of Torontonians improved substantially. Let's fast forward to 1934, our friend Dr. Bruce, He's now Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. At, at the uh, 100th anniversary of uh, Toronto's founding, he gave a speech and he called for an end to the slums in Toronto. The slums that were giving us a terrible combination of poverty, poor housing, poor health. The Bruce Commission said we've got to get rid of Toronto's last remaining slum, Moss Park. Open sewers uh, in Moss Park. Replace it with modern housing, modern conveniences to help the Toronto improve. Fast forward to 2010, we're a horribly divided city. We have rich Toronto and we have poor Toronto. And this, these divisions are not just in terms of income, but they're divisions in terms of our health. Rich Toronto, this is a map of diabetes in Toronto. The darkest areas, the areas with the worst prevalence of diabetes. Poor Toronto, poor housing, lots of diabetes. Rich Toronto, Good housing, diabetes very low. But it's not just diabetes. There are 39 indicators of health that the Medical Officer of Health has said that inequality costs us. It's costing us 1,100 premature deaths annually in the city of Toronto. It's a 16 year wait in this city for people to get a house on our affordable housing waiting list. Core housing need, the most significant indicator of precarious housing in the city, about 83% in 15 years. But it's not that we've forgotten how to build housing in this city. We built lots of boutique residences from $2 million up. We're building lots of housing in this city, but we're not building the right kind of housing. We're not building housing for low, moderate, and middle income households. Now, what we need in Toronto is we need a home for everyone, everywhere in Toronto. It's very simple, that's our vision for a healthy and equitable Toronto. And I have some good news. We actually have a very simple solution to it, and the solution comes from the United States. Hundreds of U.S. cities already have inclusionary housing, inclusionary zoning policies. There are strict rules that say every new development has to have a fixed percentage of affordable housing. Lots of U.S. cities have housing. Here in Toronto, we have some good developments. A project that we worked on, the Wells Institute, inclusive. We have St. Lawrence neighborhood, an inclusive neighborhood. But there's no rules that say developers have to include that in every neighborhood. And so what do they do? They build for middle and upper income people. They don't build for people that need it. So what we need in Toronto is we need city councils to create detailed inclusionary zoning rules for every developer in every part of the city. And we need our Ontario government to give the city permission to do that because that's the way the rules work. But once we do that, we can start to link inclusionary housing to lots of other city building initiatives. Transit City, Tower of Noah, Waterfront Toronto, all going to spur growth in the city. We need to make sure some of that growth is good affordable homes for people like you and me. So in the election of uh, 2010, we need to vote for a healthy Toronto. We need to vote for an inclusive Toronto. Vote no for NIMBY, for people who want to keep affordable housing out of neighborhoods. Yes to inclusionary housing. Yes to inclusionary zoning. Thank you very much. We love you already, Desmond, but you know, if, if you don't love this guy up, I'll have to come out there and like slap you or something, because this, this guy has basically just killed himself writing this speech. Okay, he's been, he's been sweating it out, he's been writing on the floor, he's been throwing papers left right, he sacrificed his eyesight, there's no light down here. Okay, so if you don't give him the warmest possible welcome, our very own Desmond Cole. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people in Toronto's neighborhoods are permanent residents or landed immigrants. They are our neighbors and our fellow city caretakers. Like all residents, they have a stake in a strong, healthy neighborhood. What they lack in their neighborhoods is a local vote. So who can vote locally? Well, you can as long as you're 18 years old, a Toronto resident who owns a rent property in Toronto, or their says. You are not prohibited from voting uh, by any law, and you are a Canadian citizen. But hang on. 
We give non-residents who hold property, or their spouses, in Toronto, uh, a vote, but not people who live their lives here. And even if you do hold property from outside Toronto, you still can't vote without citizenship. It's like Monopoly election edition or something. <laughs> I Vote Toronto believes citizenship and control of public property can't be the only factors to decide who needs a local voice. But don't take my word for it. Oh no, just look at our institutions at all levels of government. Let's start with the province. Once upon a time in Toronto, you had to be a citizen in order to practice law. But the Supreme Court decided citizenship was the inappropriate standard. So today, non-citizens can practice law, and we acknowledge that their ability to do so is unrelated to their uh, citizenship status. Once upon a time in Toronto, you had to be a citizen to serve on a city agency, board, or commission. But then the city realized the benefits of including the voices of the zookeeper from India, the librarian from Kenya, the bureaucrat from Belgium, and we got rid of that law too. And believe it or not, if you're not a citizen, you can still enlist with the reserve of the Canadian Armed Forces, who is the If the military feels you have a special talent, then permanent residency is good enough. These are examples of social goods that people can offer regardless of citizenship. See these little boys sticking their heads up the portable here? They attend Thorncliffe Park Public School. That's the largest middle school in North America. There's a lot of kids there, but most of them are recent immigrants, which means that their parents can't even vote for their school board trustee. There's 250,000 of these people, uh, permanent residents, at least, and that doesn't include their parents. So, excluding them means that they don't get a voice in their local services, their schools, their parks, their libraries, their pools, community centers, and uh, the police, even though those things serve everyone. Our campaign believes that newcomers need and want to participate in their neighborhoods, and that the sooner they do, the better they will contribute. Uh, the current exclusion of local voting is not protecting our society from any harm or interference. It is only protecting the status quo. And we don't want to do that, do we? No! So what have we done? We've partnered with 67 organizations around the city and across the province, not just to get the vote passed, but to help educate anyone who wants to get involved in the process. We've joined with people who are permanent residents to ask them to tell their stories. And you know what? They're the same as everybody else's. All they want is safe neighborhoods, decent employment, and to, uh, to get money for the services that they pay for. We've also uh, come together, uh, despite, uh, or sorry, across the city, with uh, people in this room and people who are looking for reform all across the city. And since we're all talking about reform, it's nice that we can do it together. But in the case of I Go Toronto, we've got to talk about more than just Toronto. We have 444 municipalities in Ontario, but the province decides who's going to own all of them. So we have to urge the province to make this change and have local representation be for everyone. And if you think it can't be done, all you have to do is look at France, Germany, South Korea, the United Kingdom, Spain, Chile, Barbados, Israel, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Belgium, the United States of America, Argentina, Venezuela, and many more. And if they can do it, guys, then what on earth are we waiting for? Our motto is diversity, our strength. And there's nothing wrong with diversity being our strength. As long as we give diverse people in our city a vote and a voice, we need your help. My name is Ben McCall. I'm the project coordinator of the I Vote Toronto campaign. You can find us by email, phone, web, the web, Facebook, or Twitter. But since you've come all the way out here tonight, I hope you'll just come and say hello. Thank you so very much. Quite a show. The bar is very high. I know I'm not helping you, am I? And, and he's from the light side of CSI too. He's my bro there, right? Okay, so there's some love. We'll give you a little bit of love. I think probably a lot of people know Mark Chisnicki. Yeah. There you go. He's a bit more love. He's very plugged in, very sign in, sign up, wired today. He's trying to tweet his entire text in today, I think. But we're going to get the live version now. So please, a warm welcome to our final contestant, Mark Kiznicki. <laughs> say one thing because I am sort of finishing this thing off to say this event needs to happen all over Toronto. <laughs> Thank you. I think that uh, that's the 
glad you agree with me on that one. So, um, you said, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, I believe that our politics are broken, and I believe that the only way to fix them is by building community and changing ourselves. Change Camp began here in Toronto in January of last year. It was an event in in, that focused on reimagining government and citizenship in the age of participation. It was copied in Ottawa, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Halifax. Change Camp spread because we combined small group, face-to-face -face conversations, lots of social media content, and a format that said, copy me, please. As a community, we have a couple of goals. Those are. Oh, well, we're missing a couple. Uh, to basically help uh, the government become more, oh, more open and transparent, but also to engage citizens with each other around their civic passions. And I believe that we are seeing the resurgence of everyday superheroes. I believe that each of us are heroes in waiting, but each of us can demonstrate the universal myth of the hero's journey. Yeah! If each of us is a hero, then there are unsuspecting heroes among us everywhere. And because of technology, we can connect, connect in new ways, and now those unsuspecting heroes can know themselves and each other. When you combine community organizing, city citizen heroes, the social web, and maybe a new style of leadership, amazing things become possible, previously unimaginable things. And these are two of our inspirations. Clay Shirky writes about technology and society. His book, Here Comes Everybody, The Power of Organizing Without Organizations. Peter Block developed a model for community transformation using a simple method of small group face-to-face -face conversations. Peter Block's method is focused on building connectedness between each other in our communities. He sees our problems as excuses to get together and build the connections among us. Turkey is highlighting the, the remarkable transformation that's happening in our society because we can all be creators. Every one of us can engage in a global conversation and we can simultaneously participate in many different kinds of communities. So, the Change Camp community is building a citizen toolkit that combines these ideas and methods using both face-to-face -face and online community organizing to convene conversations in our community about the future we want to create. To do this, we need to change how we gather, how we engage in dialogue, how we create things of value, and we need a new kind of community leadership to apply these tools in a way to transform our, our communities and our politics. So this is my invitation to all of you. How can we use the election as an excuse to restore and build the community relatedness and shift the conversation about Toronto towards new possibilities. We need to assemble a toolkit. And on Tuesday, we're hosting an event with 240 people who will help us build that toolkit. Woo! Thank you. Um, and we want to enable these community organizers around Toronto to invite their fellow citizens into this conversation. Gathering community organizers, some of you are in this room, some of you are community heroes, some of you are heroes in waiting. I'm challenging all of us to be the heroes that we are, and we need to connect these organizers, these tools, with partners, with people that have access to networks, to knowledge, to resources, to spaces, and to capacity to convene community. My name is Mark Kuznicki, and I'm here to recruit you, all of you. And I hope that you change our politics by changing the conversation about Toronto and that happens in coffee shops, water coolers, and yes, in comment threads. Thank you. far back to see perhaps on the Twitter feed was that the rebel mayor made the point that he was not a Canadian citizen when he was the mayor of Toronto. Wow. Yes. That would be William Lyon Mackenzie. When Jane Jacobs, who lived around the corner and probably saw many a movie in the poor Alex and probably drank a bunch of beer in the front of a thousand times. 
was not a citizen of Canada when she helped stop the Spadina Expressway. Okay? Lots of non citizens do valuable stuff. They are more acted upon than acting in municipal politics. So let's bring them in. Okay, Heather and Jen, are you up here? Are you here? Marcus Nicky makes it the perfect point to end this. This has got to keep on happening. There's got to be more events like this. So let's bring up the amazing organizers.
I get it? Check mark? Yeah. I get a photo on here. Yeah. Alright. Two more things. One, this party is going to be starting now. Uh, music courtesy of Jonathan. So it's going to be rocking. Oh, we. Okay. And the final and best announcement. Announcement or a question. I wonder who's going to help organize one of these in Scarborough and New York. We got it. Your house, get in touch, thanks a lot. But it's gotta be, both of you all, if you have a point seven. Like, say, mayoral candidate out there. <laughs>